we're going to start the, the workshop, OK? Do you want to start the slide? Oh, gosh. What is a service manager? Um, well, I mean, systemd is a service manager. Yes. Oh, Whoa. gosh. Boo. Should we get it? Well, we, we can do that. Uh, Let's yeah, well, we'll call AV back later. No, but, uh, in the meantime, I will try to choose speaker. The speaker uh, seems to not be working. Right, not working. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm just going to keep going. So you'll hear us say service manager a lot. Um, basically, we're just referring to something that manages your services, or in this case, just the processes on your host. Um, it allows you to define some operations for your services and also provide some guarantees about life cycle, in theory. Um, in the good old days, we had um, these init scripts, and that was our idea of service manager. Um, and then you end up with a bunch of shell scripts that look a bit like this. Um, and you have to kind of define all of the verbiage for how you want your service to actually operate. Um, and there's like a bunch of boilerplate that you copy and paste from your previous shell script because who knows what, how that worked before. Um, the problem with this is it's not really clear how you start and stop a method. It's not exactly the same between each script. Um, so for example, in this uh, Cassandra example, why are there like two start commands? I don't know. Yeah, for instance, if you were to ask on the, on the previous command, right, what is the user that start Cassandra? It would not be clear unless you're actually familiar with all of those commands, right? Um, so you now not only have to be an expert on, on, the, on the application that you're deploying, you also have to be an expert on batch and how to set up uh, your startup scripts. And nope. So the slides, no. And these are going to be very short. So, uh, but after this, we're going to go to, to the GitHub. And, and there is a GitHub where we do the tutorial. Uh, sorry, the question was, uh, is there a website where we can follow the slides? Go ahead. Um, and maybe even more importantly, there was no way to figure out whether your service was actually running and uh, get any kind of observability or logs out of it, um, at least not in a standardized way. Um, so we kind of named those problems, but um, additionally, boot and shutdown was slow. Um, like I said, getting logs was not standardized, so debugging was kind of hard. Um, and at the time, Upstart and Systemd were emerging technologies. Um, and in the end, Systemd won. So that's what the majority of Linux distribution these days are now using to manage their services. Yeah, so um, this is just sealing into the territory of the, of, of the workshop. But um, the main difference between, and you're going to see it when we start, the main difference between Systemd and initd is that in in your batch script that you were doing, um, you tell you tell the initd what to do and how to do it, while in systemd you tell just what to do. Systemd will figure out how to do it, what is the best way to represent the things that you want. Okay. Okay, hey, cool. So uh, now the workshop, if you want to follow along, is on this URL. I'm going to give you all a second to go in into the URL. And then we'll get started. We can get the URL back up. Um, so the way this workshop is written is that you can actually do most of this on your own time if you just um, if you fall behind or you're not able to get your setup or anything. Um, you can watch us do it, and then you can also take this workshop home and like do it and follow the instructions. Um, if during the workshop you need help um, or you get stuck somewhere, just raise your hand. 
Um, one of us who's not speaking might come over, might. Um, if you have a question though, uh, just to distinguish between whether you need help or not, please raise two hands, just so we know to call on you and answer your question. Okay, so the um, if for all of you who are doing background, the way that you start this thing is you do background up, and this will pull the latest background that we have built, that I built yesterday. Hopefully you already did, go ahead. The question was, can I zoom in more? And the answer is yes. Is that better? Perfect. Okay, cool, so um, there's three. Okay, we still have some Linode instances available, uh, and if they run out, we can just provision some on the fly, so feel free to, to use them. Okay, cool, so once you do background up, background SSH should take you inside the machine. And this is a uh, hello Bowie. There, uh, this is um, a virtual machine running on your host. It's run Fedora 39, if I'm not mistaken. It has the latest and brightest of systemd, uh, and has a lot of like code examples already made for you. Um, so we start with the. Um, So what you do on the on GitHub, you navigate workshop, getting started, and then the readme, uh, and this is exactly what we went through. So we can get started with systemd. Okay. Okay, that sounds that sounds like I can maybe make this work. Okay, cool. So, uh, okay, so what we are gonna go, with, where we're gonna start is basically the most simple part of systemd, which is creating system units, right? Um, so, what I ask people to do in this one is that in your terminal, in your you can go to etc system, you can do ls. Let me, actually, yeah. So you can do ls and then do a folder called etc systemd systems. And then you're gonna see that right there, there is a bunch of files that has extensions. Um, some of these extensions are target, some extensions are service, uh, there's gonna be timers and other, and other things. Those are the ones that we're gonna go and check out uh, between today and tomorrow. So the first things that we probably want to do is that we want to create a file that is called my first service. Uh, so you can use BIM if you're comfortable with it. And then just copy the content of this into the file. You can use Nano, I think we have Nano, um, or maybe Emacs. So this should be the simplest uh, service unit that you can create. Um, it's still a little bit more complicated than the simplest simplest, uh, but it gives you like a good understanding of 
actually how you talk to systemd right so you here you see you have a declarative document instead of having a shell script that define how to start your application or where to store your pid files and all the things um, you have a declarative file that tells you the description what is your file right um, what is the service that you're creating it has uh, an application that you use to run uh, has a policy for how the, the service is going to restart, sorry, has a policy on how the service is going to restart, uh, and has an install section that um, we're going to definitely look at it later, but it basically, if you remember the good old run levels, those are your installs. So um, if somebody want to install everything that has to do with users, all they need to do is start multi-user target, and this unit becomes part of that, right? So there's no longer the need to put this into a particular folder. You can just describe um, what you're doing. This, though, assume that there is a script here that is called service uh, who am I dot py and it's, uh, and it's executable, right? So let's see if this is true. And you can go, just copy and paste it and execute it. And this very little clown script, like everything that I write, uh, is just display a bunch of, um, a bunch of information about the running process, right? It has the infamous Python syntax warning. Um, uh, it shows you like who started the, the unit, uh, the, 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 the scope, whatever that means. Um, ask like what is the main PID, whatever that means. Uh, and then it just print a bunch of environmental variable that as you can see, those are as Unix you always do, inherent from my environment, right? So if I type M, you see that those environmental variables seems pretty similar. Um, by the way, if you are using background or daily node and then you're in a Tmax shell, which you probably should, if you press Control K, uh, you can clean your your buffer. So it's it's a good thing to like have image cleans. Okay, uh, okay. So now we have the service. So we have tell system D what they have to what it has to do, which is which is how to start the unit. Now we need to tell it to start it, right? So, and the way that it works is that you use systemctl, you do start, and then you specify the name of the thing that you just created. My first service dot service, and you start it, and very anticlimactic, nothing really happens, just returns. Um, so yeah, what happened? Uh, we can go and change this and ask for status, and I know that today we take this for granted, but the fact that we have so much information about how a service is running for free by just saying, this is the script that you use to, like, this is what I want to start, it is pretty amazing. So you get a bunch of information here. First of all, it tells you where the service is defined. Very useful. It tells you what is the, st that is the status. It's running. It starts running 18 seconds ago. It tells you a main PID. Okay, so this is interesting. So now you have a unit, and there's something in that unit that is the root of that unit, that is the main PID. It tells you how many tasks it has. A uh, task is basically how much uh, forks are running. Um, so when you start an application and then you want to like chill out to do something, you need to fork an exec. Each fork counts as a task. Uh, it tells you how much CPU is using for whatever that means. And it has this beautiful, beautiful thing over here that it tells you C group. So um, before we kind of dive into this, um, and we have a tutorial for C groups here, how many people here are familiar with C groups? Okay, nice. This is this is great because like people know systemd, but now they so they might not learn much, but now they are going to learn a lot about C groups. So um, before we actually talk about what our C groups are, um, just imagine that C group is a control group and it's a way for you to impose restrictions on a service. But systemd does something very interesting with C groups. It is for each service that it starts, it put all of those, all of the things that are on the service on a, on a C group per service, right? So this one has a C group that is called my first service dot service, right? So it basically, when you say I want to start my service, it creates a C group and then everything that starts goes in there. So now systemd can keep track in a better way of what things started with the service, right? So in the good old days, when you start Apache, uh, oh, I'm old, uh, and you want to like stop Apache, what you do is that you kill the main PID, 
right? To figure out because Apache would write like a PID file. Um, but you never really knew what did Apache started, right? So like, like sometimes you chill out and then you double forks or you escape the parent. So there's no way of keeping track of that. And then you stop Apache, but then there's a bunch of loggers running around. Uh, with systemd, that doesn't happen because systemd can keep track of all the services because it keeps track of the C group. And when you say stop the unit, it will stop the C group. So yeah, so let's do that. I believe that's the thing things that is uh, let's stop the service. Oh, by the way, sorry, and here in this, you can also see there is a, a little bit of the output of the unit, which is also kind of useful. Um, oh, uh, sorry, and the unit just sleep infinity. I will probably show you what, what the unit does, but later. So, okay, <coughs> bless you. Uh, we can stop the unit. So to stop the unit, we do something very simple. With If you do start for start, you do stop for stop. That makes perfect sense. So now let's go back and do status. And now you see that it provides you all the information that you need, right? So it, it logs correctly that systemd was the one who stopped the unit, um, where the unit was, what is the status. So it gives you all this, all this information that, that you may want to have from the unit. Now, if you want this to actually start the service when the system start, you need to enable the unit. And if we go here and we do systemctl enable, you're gonna see that a uh, systemd create a symlink for this, the service units that you just wrote and it put it there into a multi-user target. Not to spoil the future, but what is gonna happen eventually when you start your machine, systemd will start uh, the first the first target that start all the targets, and one of those targets is multi-user. Uh, and when, when systemd start multi-user, it will start all the units that were installed by multi-user. I will do that in parallel uh, as much as it can, so it makes boot fast. So, so far, uh, everybody who's following along is following along, or there's somebody who is behind it? Behind or, or following along? Perfect. Success. We did it. Okay, cool. So uh, let's move on to uh, modifying a unit, right? Um, again, this is system D one on one, so we have to go through all the basics so we can do better. Okay, cool. So let's do something very interesting. We we can take the the unit that we just modify uh, that we just created over here. In case uh, if you're typing along and you don't know how to do this, you can do Control R to do reverse search, and then you find Beam, which was the command that I used. Press Enter; it takes you there. And then we're gonna add here the user nobody. Right. So um, in Linux, there's basically only two users that are present in every single host. So the first one is a uh, root, the second one is nobody. That is kind of like the only one that uh, systems tends to agree on and then everything else can even have like different uh, UI UIDs. Okay, uh, so we are gonna start, uh, so we're gonna modify this unit, add the user nobody, and now by looking at the unit, you can actually see what user it's gonna run the, the service. That's what you that's what we wanna do, right? All right, cool. So let's start the unit, okay? I'm gonna take some time. I'm gonna start it. And then a system D did start the unit. Like if I do status, you're gonna see that it start the unit, but it actually complain about something, right? So it says like the unit file uh, or drop-ins uh, have changed on disk, but it system D will not pick up those changes unless you explicitly tell it to pick those changes, right? Um, this is mostly because um, you care about atomic changes. Uh, like sometimes you need to modify 
more than one unit at the same time. So if you modify one and those changes get picked up immediately, like catastrophic things can happen, right? So um, system D allows you to like reload everything when you when you uh, when you start. So the way that you tell system D to reload stuff. Oh, first of all, let's stop. And uh, now you do this little command over here. Systemctl daemon reload. You do that and it holds. Um, what basically that does, systemd will go and read every single unit. Um, and now you can start and then nobody's complaining. Now the beauty of this is that, uh, remember this old status? <laughs> For some reason, I thought the user would have been the status, but yeah, but it, but it, yeah. So, um, and it shows that the user that I was using is nobody. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna do. There you go. So uh, let's take a look at this script. Uh, service, who am I? Uh, the best way you can do this is you just cut the script. It's very short, but also you can see it because it should be on your bin folder. Service, who am I? Yes, sorry. Those are hands for questions. Okay. It's do everything at a change. It's, it's atomic. Sorry. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. So the question was, does systemd, uh, when you do daemon reload, does it uh, reload everything? Or you can specify certain things. It does everything uh, at the same time. I, that was my, my understanding about a year or a year and a half ago. I don't know if, if that has changed. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's atomic. I used to remember that uh, this is like an event loop, right? So if like it actually has to like reload everything, so it has to stop. So this process tends to be very heavy. You don't want to do that like every single time. Cool. Any other questions that people may have right now? All right. Oh, this doesn't look good at all. Sorry. Does this one looks better? I think it does. Okay. So. Let's see a little bit about the script that, that we are running. Um, we're going to abuse Python a lot here. Um, we do, do some coding in Shell and, and in C to show you later. But uh, in general, we try to do most of our stuff in Python. So the script is pretty simple. It basically just figured out stuff about the unit. Um, then it prints this beautiful ASCII art. It tells you what is the user. It tells you what PYD was running. Uh, it tells you something, something, what is the service. Uh, and then it prints all the environmental variables. Uh, if there is a no sleep environmental variable, uh, so, sorry, as long as there's no sleep environmental variable, what it does, it goes and exec into, into, into sleep. So, Whatever when you if you saw here into the terminal when I did status, you see that the the thing that is running there, it's sleep infinity and not um, and and not the actual exec unit, right? So it keeps track exactly what it is. It kind of also tells you like the PYD. So and question because I didn't realize. Do you guys see the... Is Okay, perfect. Uh, 
that seems to be better. I don't know if it's the best, but it's the best I can do. There you go. So, where were we? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so we already went for what the script does. So, let's do some journal CTL and let's learn a new command, right? So, you can paste that journal CTL command. Uh, and this is actually quite interesting, right? So journal CTL, um, it's one thing that comes out of the box with systemd. We have a full session on it. Um, but for now, the what it does is that everything that goes into STD out or STD air of your unit gets logs into, into the unit, right? So you get log for free. No need to start like skimming into bar log, uh, my service dot log. Uh, even though you can still do that. But but the point is that a uh, system D journal, uh, sorry, journal D will uh, log your things, right? So now you can actually see uh, the entire output. Remember that status has a little output at the end? Now this is like the entire output. Um, you can see that it shows like the informations that we were looking. Um, yeah. the. No need to know everything, but in general, this just tells you show me the last 30 lines. No hostname tells me don't show me the hostname because that's boring. Uh, and then that you tells you show me the unit. If you were to remove, let's let's do this just because of fun. If you were doing journal CTL F as follow as you would tell, and don't put any unit in it, you are gonna see that. It's basically just showing you everything that happened on the system, right? Uh, that's not part of this tutorial, but uh, I thought it was a fun thing to know. Okay, cool. So, override units. Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. So, okay, so uh, let's do some override units. Um, so there's a few ways in which you can edit a system the unit. The, it's a text file, so you can just beam into it, and then, great, you're good. Uh, but uh, maybe you want to do something that is called an override. And the override is pretty useful, right? So imagine that you are a package maintainer, and then you are creating your your service. And your serv like, I don't know, you decided you are Nginx, right? So when you, when you install the Nginx RPM, it comes with a system unit, which is the thing that that the, that the uh, vendor tells you or tells uh, like how their system should start. You don't want to modify that unit, right? Because uh, like if, if, for instance, if you want to change the u the user that system did start uh, the, the service, um, and you don't want to modify that unit because if that's managed by an RPM, when you reinstall, either the RPM will decide not to upgrade that version, or worse, it will override it. Uh, RPM will not override it, but but in general, like. It will, like every package manager can do that. Uh, so the way the system this solves this problem is by allowing you to have override configs. So these are configs that you put next to your configs that allows you to extend it. Or what is the opposite of extended? Reduce? I don't know. Uh, like if you don't, if, if you don't like this something start as a as a as a user and you don't like it and you want to remove that option, you can do it also with override. There you go. So let's do this. Uh, 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 um. Okay, so the okay, so the way that you would do this is that uh, we're not going to do it like this. But uh, if you definitely just want to do this by hand, you create. Remember, your unit was called uh, my service uh, dot service. So if you create a directory there called the name of your unit dot t, and then add any conf inside of it, this is called an override unit, right? So and whatever you put there. The uh, system is going to load the unit and then load your conf, and whatever the conf do does, it's going to win. Um, but instead of doing that, we can actually do this thing that is called uh, systemctl edit. Since systemd already knows where the files are and where it has to put the files, like, sure, it must be nice to help people out. So if you do systemctl edit, you get this beautiful thing, right? And it tells you, hey, I am doing exactly what I told, what you were planning to do by hand. I am editing etc systemd system my first service dot service dot d override dot conf. 
right? Um, and it kind of shows you the previous the, the previous unit. So this is still exists. It's still a unit. Whatever you put here, it is what it is. Okay, cool. So what are we doing? Oh yes, we are adding an environmental variable. So with we don't have to put everything again. Uh, we don't have to specify everything. We're just going to say for service, the, envir the environment add special m equal equals activated. <laughs> I think we can just save it, and then it tells you successfully install. Uh, so. Oh, sorry, there was a question, Anita. You probably know this answer better than me, and I, and I don't want. Uh, s when you do daemon reload, system D reloads all the units, right? But it h can you reload just the unit that you modify? No, you, if you, just the contents itself, you can't do individual unit reloads. Yeah, I, I, I did remember that, yes. So, yeah, cool. I didn't lie to you. That's good. Okay, the, okay, so, um, that's the one. Okay, so, uh, let's do, so we modify the unit, we added stuff, so let's restart the unit, perfect. Uh, by the way, uh, when we did system CL edit, system D also take care of the heavy lifting of all, not only adding the, finding where the unit is, writing the override, saving it, it also reload the daemon, the daemon, so you don't need to like do daemon reload if you do it this way. Uh, so I restarted, and then we're gonna do this journal CTL thing over here. So, I know we're dumping a lot of syntax to you, um, but, and like we say, it's 15 lines, the unit, and we're doing G for grep. So we're grepping this a content of this line, right? So if I do that, it kind of shows me that the unit uh, that with that PYD has the special M activated, which is the thing that we added. So great, it works. Okay, so, um, okay, cool. So let's do, uh, let's modify the unit again. And now you can see that we have the previous unit. Uh, let's add uh, this memory max over here that is 10 megabytes, right? So we're telling, we're just setting one of many system D options to control how much memory the service can use. We save it. Uh, and then we can do the following. And this is why I wanted to do this, I remember now. Now you can see that there is an override, right? And then that the memory here is set directly to max, right? So I want to explain like why do I think this example is useful. Um, remember that we changed the user. Uh, and we needed, to, or we had an environmental variable, and we needed to restart the unit for the for that change to pick up, right? Um, but now I changed another setting, which was the memory, and I didn't need to restart the unit for it to pick up. So anybody here can say, why do you think this happens besides making life inconsistent? Yes, go ahead, anybody, just shout it. Oh yeah, but but we did also did this with an overwrite file, right? So the thing is that w even it's it's it has to be something on the option. You wanted to say something. Oh, okay, cool. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Maybe if you if you see that a running process needs more memory, you can give it more memory without needing to restart it. Yes, so uh, it, it, it's that. Uh, I will repeat in case that doesn't sound. She said that uh, if the um, if the if the process needs more memory, you can just give it more memory. You don't need to restart it, and that is true, right? So uh, like like system D will try to do its best not to restart service and not to need that. And in order for restrict memory, what you do is that you modify the C group, which is something that you can do live, right? While adding an, an environmental variable, you can only do it at the 
startup of the application, right? So those are kind of things, right? So <coughs> um, in a way, this does abstract you a lot of, of under trying to understand what's going on under the hood, but, um, but the point is that if you do it with Edit, um, SystemD will take care of doing most of the heavy listing for you. Yeah. Okay, so that was it. And yeah, and this is, we hit, the, go ahead, two hands, go ahead. Uh, the question was, can I talk about some cases for the system D overrides? Uh, so th the one that I give about uh, Nginx, it's, it's kind of pretty common in terms of vendors, right? Uh, the Nginx is kind of the default application that my brain w goes, but um, in general, like if you're a vendor and you want to do applications, that's what you do. The other thing is that if, if you're a system administrator, one of the things that you tend to do, you also add certain overrides. So that uh, every application that runs on your host like has a firewall, which is an option that you can add, right? Or or you have a, uh, or you run something before every every unit start. There's an option that is called exec pre-start or pre-exec start something like that, uh, that is something that start before your application start, right? So you can add something to log, I don't know, right? So those, those are the kind of things when you want to do modifications on the unit without actually touching the unit. Do you have another example of, of that, Anita? Isn't, isn't the one that comes home with Fedora? Yes. Okay, so Fedora comes with, a, with an override. What does that override does? Uh, the one that changes the abort and timeout behavior on mm -hmm. units that's supposed to speed up startup. Um, I mostly use overrides to override vendor shipped units. Um, like if they ship, if they have something for SSH DDoS service and I don't like a certain behavior, um, I would use an override for that. It just really allows you a way to further tweak what's already on the system. Yeah. Uh, the Fedora one that you were saying is that like the, the Fedora, like the, 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 the Fedora pack? The, the, sorry. Fordor, right. Fordor. <laughs> yeah, Fedora also use ships overrides for their units as well, or like certain packages units. Um. Yeah. Yes, okay, cool. So uh, the rest of this part of the tutorial are us just going through a bunch of systemd commands. It should go pretty fast, and then we're gonna take our first break because it's unfair to keep three people like lock up for three hours. Um, and then you get to hear an it instead of me, so that's a plus. Okay, right, cool, so let's, okay, so uh, this is quick and dirty walkthroughs to some system D commands. Uh, we already went to status, and then the unit name. You already saw that. Uh, what you didn't saw is that uh, you can do status, and you don't need to put a unit name, right? So if you just do status, just like that, it shows you a kind of, of a list of the system from the point of view of systemd, right? So basically you're asking for the status of PID1. So, uh, sorry, not, not the status of PID1, that's not what it is, but it, but it kind of gives you like, oh, so these are all the things that are running, all the processes, kind of like give you like a nice overview. Um, this is a virtual machine, it has very little going on. The, so that's cool. Now, a lot of the time you like you do PS aux and then you see all the processes, you don't know what's the PY, like, like what's the service of a unit. Like if I do PS aux f, you're gonna see that list. And, uh, and yeah, there's a slip finity, but I have no idea what's the unit that that is. So I cannot ask for the status of that unit. But I, what I can do, that I can ask status for 5423, which is a magic number no, I'm lying. It's it's the PYD of the unit, right? So if you just know, sorry, of the of the of the process, if you just know the PYD, systemd will, since it's keeping track of everything that is under the hood, you can use systemd status by the PYD, and that's all good. If you do system CTL without the status, you get a horrible view, but uh, but it does tells you like all the units that were executed in the in the service, sorry, in the in the machine. So it has a lot of information, and if one of those is read, it means that it failed. Nothing failed here. Okay, so that's status. 
Very nice, very useful. Now, assuming now that you do know your service, like this one, and you want to actually see the content of your service, you can do systemctl cut and the name of the service. Again, since systemd knows exactly where everything is, it can nicely assemble the list of files for you and display it. Very useful. Uh, and it displays exactly what we say it should display. Now, if you want, if you don't want it to cut, if you want it to show, whatever that means, now I, we know what it means. Uh, uh, there, it will kind of tells you all the all the properties that has the the the, 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 the sorry that the unit has set. Right. So these are all the options. Go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, you, you definitely can do. It. So the thing is, um, system D uh, keeps the status of the of the entire. S sorry, the question was if we can use this to pick what you can put in override, and the answer is yes. Um, system D keep a list of all the things that that are running, um, uh, and and sorry, and for each service it has a full list of properties. So if you set ones, the other ones are the default value. Right. So now this will show you all everything, so you can override whatever you want. With that said, if I'm not mistaken, this one is using the Divas interface. So we're going to go with that. So this doesn't really map one to one to the actual setting. Like for instance, uh, here it says restart you. Uh, I'm showing. Yeah. So it says restart u seconds. Oh, let me go to the terminal. Restart max u second. That's uh, microseconds, I believe. It's it's. Um, yes, it's microseconds. It, it, the unit, the, the settings is restart max seconds, right? So you you don't you don't use the use seconds there, or or runtime max or time or something like that. We, you, you can check the dots, but that's uh, nanoseconds. Nano, nano. Okay, sure. Okay, mass is hard. Okay. Um, oh yes, no, no. Okay, perfect. Uh, but yeah, that you can do. You can also inspect just uh, a few a few settings there. So you don't need to watch everything. You can just specify that P, and it will tell you what it is. And here's what I was telling you, right? So you have exec, exec start, and it kind of show you the the way that system D sees this option, right? Like with all the with all all the different properties. But it kind of like if you want to know the main PID, you can do this main PID. to specify the unit. And this is very useful also for shell script. So if you uh, specify like that's p main pid, it will tell you main pid equals and the pid. You can also do add uh, this option over here that is called value. And then it will just give you the value. So you just shove that into an environmental variable and you're good to go. Um, yeah. S uh, any question? Comments so far? Where? Yeah. Yes, you can. Chris, interrupt me. Um, so the thing with system CTL show is that it only has what system D is stored in memory at this moment, and that's not necessarily the same as what system D is already running. So certain properties, once the unit is running already, um, you know the, that that's it. But sh you can reload and change the unit, and system CTL show will show what systemd has in memory. And uh, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at show and you're confused, like, this says this one setting, but you know, when I'm actually running the service, it says something else. Um, that's why. Uh, yes, question. Yeah. So the question here is the like, I, I you I'm gonna paraphrase. You pick at the word watchdog and ask if you can set the watchdog per service, and the answer is yes, you can. And we actually have a tutorial for that, which comes tomorrow. Yeah. So so many things you can do. Go ahead.
uh, the question was uh, when you use system kill is when the service doesn't uh, respond. Uh, so no. Um, so if you do system CDL stop, uh, that like if your service is unresponsive, you can still use system CTL stop. It will send a sick term to the service. By default, you can change all of this, but it will send a sick term. And after like a minute, if the unit didn't dive, uh, it will send a sick kill. So the stop is supposed to kill the process at the end of, of the thing. Very rarely fails. System the kill is when you want to send signal to the process, right? So the same way that, that when you use the kill command, um, you say like kill and then you send like a sick hub. Right, system CTL kill, you can do that, but you don't need to know the PYD, you just need to know the service name. So you can say kill, the summary sends CHUB to Nginx, and then systemd will figure it out what's the right way to do this. So with that, uh, we're gonna do system CTL kill. And yeah, it is, it is exactly that, right? So um, you send the signal. Ah oh yeah, but this is actually quite interesting. So I'm gonna send the signal, kill nine, like touch nine, like C kill. Like there's no coming back from that. And then I'm gonna do status. That's not the status that I want, that's the status. Uh, wait. Did I send the signal? Oh, oh great, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so you can see like the unit still running, but the startup time is seven seconds ago. Right, so what happened there is that I send the sick kill, like systemd send the sick kill to the proper main PID, that thing's died, but the systemd has this setting that you remember that it says like restart always, that we put it, so the unit restarted, right? So that was, so that's kind of like intended. If I were to do stop, and then do status, you see that the unit is stop. Is it stop? Yes, it's stop, right there it says, right? So the difference, so the difference was that um, system CDL kill, after that, the output is not that the unit has to remain stop. While you do system CTL stop, uh, system D will kill the unit, and then after that, it will ignore the always restart because you were explicit, I actually want it to stop, otherwise you will never be able to stop your unit. Uh, but it's very useful. Um, I would think like kill is such a bad name for this. <coughs> yes, it's the Unix kill. But also the Unix kill has a very bad name. Uh, okay, so all right, so um, there is a systemctl this unit, which is the same one that we already, so when you call systemctl with no parameters, it's exactly the same as calling it with no units. Sorry, with least units, so this one it's exactly the same as this one. And that again shows you like a nice view of everything that has run on the service. While system CTL status shows you everything that is running on the service, right? While the other ones shows you like things like these weird devices that are for mounting your TTYs that will not appear otherwise. Um, did you add this or did I add this? I didn't remember this. Did we add this? Did you add this? Okay, cool. Good. Good pass, Alvaro. Okay. The you have a uh, list units. Uh, so it, it <laughs> yeah, no, yes, this is, this is an awesome. Thing. So um, thanks, Anita. <laughs> the y you can use wildcard for searching. You're basically saying like, give me all the service. You can do that. Uh, it's also very useful. I'm. Yeah, it also works with system CTL status. Like it's 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 the wildcard, right? So it it kind of shows you like everything that has a service. You can be more specific than just service, uh, but that's it. And I think uh, there's other things that are cool it's called list pass, list socket, list timers that do all those things. Uh, and it's 11:04. I think it's a good time for us to take at least 10 minutes bathroom break. Coffee break. Thank you very much. If somebody have questions, oh yeah, oh yeah. So uh, is it time for Bortos? Yeah, uh, yeah. And your price for being your reward for being here and learning about System D is that we have some Portos pastries here. Uh, it's time.
Okay, perfect. Niche approved. So yeah, so you can come and grab some uh, portal pastries. They're free. You don't have to pay. You just have to eat them. Thank you. By the way.
Okay, four minutes, and we'll get back to these fun times. Great town this is. Yeah, I was I was scammed out of coffee. There's no coffee. Check, one, two, check. Okay, we are ready to get started. So um, if people can take your seats. Okay. Why do you feel like piña colada? Okay, so for the last part of SystemD 101, uh, we're gonna talk about ephemeral services. So SystemD provides a way for you to just kind of generate units on the fly, like you don't even have to write a unit file. 
Um, the only downside with this is that you, it doesn't preserve the unit between like restarts and things like that. It's just stored in memory. So we can give that a try by running this command here. Systemd run um, service to mypy. It's the same one we've been using before. So now you see that systemd created a unit file and it's starting to run it. Um, we can take a look at the contents of this unit by copying the unit name. And doing systemctl cat. And you can see that um, systemd stores the unit file in slash run, which is in memory, um, and it has the contents of what it generated here. So it should look very familiar to you already um, since you created a basic unit at first. Um, the other thing you can do with systemd run is create an interactive shell. So if you do systemd run dash dash shell, um, this will uh, kind of drop you into the shell inside of the systemd unit. So you can do systemctl status to get what the PID of this unit is. Um, and you'll see that from within the shell in the systemd run unit, uh, it looks kind of like this. Um, you can go ahead and play around with this for a bit, um, but it's basically just another bash shell within a bash shell. Um, and then when you're done, you know, just go ahead and exit and you'll be back on the host or the virtual machine, wherever you are. Any questions about that? Hmm? Oh, question. Uh, the question was, why might you want to do that? Um, do you mean systemd run or systemd run shell? The shell? Okay, so one of the useful things about systemd run shell is that um, if you're debugging some kind of complex behavior with your unit, um, you can use it to kind of drop into what the state of systemd is like. Um, for example, hmm. hmm. You got an example, Alvaro? Yes. Yeah. So, well, the, you, you can use this for tutorials and, and show <laughs> how, how things work. But in general, it's kind of like uh, looking at the world from the point of view of the unit, right? So, see, later we're going to see that systemd can do things with your file system. So, the unit may ah. think that root is read only, right? So, so you may not really know that that becomes a problem, so you can start a shell with root as read only, and then do the commands that your application would do, and that gives you like a, like a nice feeling of how the unit works. That is kind of very useful. But we use it extensively in this uh, tutorial, because like we ask you, like, modify this. Now go into a shell and run a few commands and see what the effect that has in the world. I'd say like just, just systems D run shell by itself may not be super special. But once you start getting into like the sandboxing properties um, and you run like another process along with the shell or something, um, you'll be like, hey, why isn't um, this running properly uh, compared to outside of the host? And it's because of the, how the systemd um, property is behaving. So it kind of allows you to test some of those in more detail as well. Any other questions? Uh, so the question was, how does systemd know to drop into that particular shell? Um, I mean, it, it, it's creating the unit at the same time as it's dropping you into the shell, or like it creates it, runs execs, and then you're like in the shell there. It connects the, uh, the pseudo terminal there. Does that, does that make sense? So you have two shells, the shells? Yeah. Two shells. Yes. Um, this becomes more clear maybe in the second example. So uh, we're gonna start using systemd run shell more extensively to run an interactive process. So uh, 
So systemd run shell is pretty much the same as adding this dash dash pty argument. So you can do more fancy things like I was saying by copying this command. And we add dynamic user true, which is one of the properties that um, allows you to run the process as a random user. So let's go ahead and do that now. So we do that, um, you'll see now that the uh, service who am I Python script that we ran before is now running as a uh, kind of random user that systemd has generated. Um, later in the workshop we'll talk more about uh, how dynamic user works, but just know that it's one of the ways you can use it to run your process as a, an arbitrary um, user. Um, That's it for the very first basics of system D. Are there any questions about this part before we move to the next part of the workshop? All right. Back to you, the table of contents. All right. You want me to do this one? So now we're gonna start talking about other system D unit types. So far, we've pretty much only talked about service units because those are the ones that allow you to actually run commands and execute processes. The systemd has a whole suite of other unit types that allow you to do uh, other things. So for example, timers. Um, if you are familiar with the cron tab, it allows you to, wait, to kind of periodically run a, uh, an executable or something um, on a schedule. And so if you recall the cron format, um, if you run something every 10th minute, you can do it like this, and then you add the script or whatever at the end uh, of the line. To do that with systemd, you use a timer unit. So we can go ahead and create a timer unit uh, with, the, with these contents. Um, we're gonna use systemctl edit so that we don't have to worry about uh, reloading um, the unit later. I'm gonna copy the content. So the difference between a service is this timer section here. Um, and the property, un one of the properties under timers is on calendar, and that allows you to kind of insert a cron style uh, format and allow you to run the timer. And if we want this to run at, or like start the timer at boot, we also added this install section and it's wanted by timers.target. Let's go ahead and exit. Um, because we use systemctl edit, it already reloaded for us. So that set up the timer section. How do we actually include the script that it's supposed to run? We do that with, uh, by creating a service unit of the same name. And we can copy these contents here. And this is just a generic service unit like what we saw before in the uh, previous tutorial. And what this is gonna do is run service who am I, a Python script you're already familiar with, and set the environment variable to uh, no sleep equals no. Let's go ahead and save this as well. And now we can actually We can go ahead and start the timer and watch when it fires. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, start the timer, and we use watch here to see when uh, the status changes on either the timer or the service unit. Ooh, Ooh. it's running. 
So you saw that the timer executed and um, the service status now spits out uh, the usual logs that you're familiar with. I guess the other thing worth noting about the timer is the, uh, I guess, let's dig into the status of the timer unit a bit more. So let's delete this watch command. Um, so if you, you're all already familiar with system CTL status, on timers we also get this trigger and triggers behavior. Um, so what that does is it will tell you when the, or like when the unit, when the timer will next run and trigger this service. Um, there is a property where you can actually change the service that the timer triggers. Um, you can kind of look that up in the man page, but by default, if the service has the same name as the timer, it will trigger that service. Um, what else is interesting here? Um, we already know about loaded. It's when systemd had loaded this unit into memory. Um, yes, question. So the question is, what's the advantage of using systemd timers over um, the previous cron jobs? So. Using on calendar, we don't get to see a lot of like the special sauce with timers. Um, we're going to go into some more properties later. Um, but I think the primary advantage is that we can actually trigger like a whole service file. And with that, you can define, um, you can fine tune the behavior of how the command should run um, re in relation to the timer. Whereas with CronTab, it just kind of runs the script and then it exits. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one. The, the there's other two things that I think I kind of like mainly superior to cron. But first, let's say like cron, is, it is very simple and, it's, and it is very familiar. So like you can use that one if if, if you like, right? Uh, but yeah, so the first one is the use of time. Um, System D has monotonic, uh, monotonic. So you can say trigger this five seconds after the previous uh, execution, or you can do or you can do see, since boot do this half an hour after boot, like those kind of things. Like it doesn't have to be tied to a particular time of day. Um, there's also flexibility in giving you like splice. I don't know if that's the right word, but it is like start this at one plus minus five seconds, right? So you can like 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 uh, distribute a whole set of things uh, in time, right? So that's the first one that I would say it's pretty useful. And the other one, it is where the strong suit of system D is, is that you actually get a status and logs and and like like in log in cron, it's really hard to see if your thing ran and what was the status of that run. You, you need to inspect logs in system D. You just say like status of my timer, and it will tell you yes, I was here, I did what I was supposed to do, and it exit successfully or failure, right? So it kind of gives you that. Well, now we're going to see all the things that Alvaro just described. <laughs> so starting with the monotonic timers, um, let's just go ahead and edit our first timer and change on calendar to instead use on active 30 seconds. Um, so what on active second does is it basically says let's just run this or execute this timer 30 seconds after we activate the unit um, and basically it will never run again. So you can also combine this behavior with um, that by itself is probably not super interesting but you can also combine it with like on calendar, on active seconds, on boot. Um, and things like that to further change how you want to start the unit behavior. So let's start the Yeah. 
So if you're looking at this watch, you see that there is a countdown till the unit's gonna trigger. Oh my god. Okay. Great, it triggered. <laughs> and in theory if we uh, we're gonna if we look at it again, it will not show like a next trigger time. Yeah, it elapsed, and that, that was pretty much it. Um, their system has a bunch of different properties like that. Um, in the next example, we have on active seconds, on boot seconds, and there's probably a few more that I'm forgetting, but you can always look in the man page for the rest. Okay. Okay, so um, similar to ephemeral uh, service units, you can also create ephemeral timers if you just kind of want to run something on the fly. So if you do systemd run on active 30 seconds and just echo this, um, echo hello from the past, it will automatically create a timer and the corresponding service unit for you. As seen here, you see that it's now running this timer unit and it also runs, uh, also will run this service unit when it fires. Um, and similar to before, you can do, And you'll see that the timer is already active and it's just waiting to, well, it probably already ran because I didn't do the watch. <laughs> it already created the service um, and the timer and it was gonna fire it after the 30 seconds. Yes, and thanks to Avro, we can see that, uh, well, it was active. Yeah, it was active 39 seconds ago, and it already fired down here. It's hello from the past. Yeah. Um, so the other thing Alvaro was talking about was splay. Um, so if you don't want, if you're managing like a fleet of hosts, and you don't want every single timer to kind of start at the same time because that would overload um, whatever service you're trying to mm -hmm. make them call or something like that, um, Systemd provides a way to automatically randomize the um, when the timer execution actually fires. So to do that, you can use a randomized delay seconds. Um, I also like to combine this with fixed random delay because if you have fixed random delay equals no, every time you actually reload the unit, um, Systemd will change the, the amount of randomization that goes into when the timer executes. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll make it random every time. So it's not gonna have like a consistent uh, random delay. Um, so let's look at uh, this unit as an example and its contents. Um, can someone tell me what it does? Brave soul, any brave soul? Sarah over here with two hands. I am going to guess and say that it will run every 30 seconds, but with a random give or take of uh, 10 seconds, uh, but probably the same random give or take of 10 seconds every time. Yeah, that sounds good enough to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, you win Portos. Yo, so uh, I actually don't know. I'm actually bad at reading cron tabs. I believe this is 30 minutes, right? Every uh, yes, it is. Yes. yes. So this will run the timer every 30 minutes. Um, sorry, not totally correct. You didn't say you no, said seconds. No, this is seconds, right? Oh, it is? Seconds. Okay, never mind. I'm wrong. Yeah, yes, it's it'll run the timer every 30 seconds, adding uh, up to 10 seconds of random delay. Okay, uh, so extra stuff we won't cover. Um, like I said, there are a bunch of other properties. You can 
use to set your timer behavior, such as um, when the clock changes, when the time zone changes, um, or when the system wakes up. Ooh, actually one thing about time zones, this is a big gotcha. When you use on calendar, it uses your local time zone. I know, it's crazy, right? So like when daylight saving comes around and your timer doesn't fire for like the next hour, uh, that's probably why. So <laughs> on calendar uses the calendar. <laughs> yes, yes, I mean, it sounds obvious like on calendar, but it, that's a huge difference from the cron tab behavior. So um, you can actually stick a time zone on the on calendar if you like really don't want to, or you can use the monatomic timers, which are based on your system. Or write things in UTC, UTC zero. Oh gosh. Okay, so. Uh, Yes, monotonic timer. Time is an illusion. It doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're not going to go over every single unit, but the other interesting one you probably want to know about are path units. Um, so what path units allow you to do is uh, kind of watch a file or a certain path and then run like a service or something uh, when that, that file changes or it's modified or it's created. So let's go ahead and create this um, sh config watcher path. And I'm going to copy the contents from our GitHub by clicking the button. Oh, okay. um, so let's look at what we have here on this path unit. Um, Similar to service and timer, it has kind of a path type or header, I don't know what you call this. Um, it has a path change property. So what we're gonna do is watch when etc, sh, shd config, um, the contents are changed and saved to disk. And of course we need the corresponding service unit along with it, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. Just copy it from GitHub. So what the service is gonna do is um, when the path unit fires, uh, we are going to systemctl reload shd.service. Um, I got a good question during the break about systemctl reload. So certain service units define a reload behavior. Um, shd is one of them. Um, you might wanna do this if instead of uh, restarting your whole service to pick up changes. You just want to run reload and the in your code itself, uh, you, you do something to, you know, reload the config or whatever. So let's go ahead and save that. Oh, and now we can actually, we'll go ahead and enable the path unit and then start it. Now we can check the status of SHD, just to see where we're at. Um, and you can see right now that SHD is just running normally, but if we, um, let's say we just modify the ETC SSH. SHD config. This is the, the file that we're watching on the path. Um, let's say that we uncomment these lines here to change the log level and then save it. If we look at the status of SHD again, you'll see that the process actually changed to executing its reload behavior, which is what we actually defined um, in the steps above to create the path unit and the service unit. Um, um, and also the other interesting thing is that system B tells you when it reloads, so you can see down here, 
that uh, systemd had it reloaded shd. Okay. Any questions about this? Um, and then, of course, you can use systemd run to also create an ephemeral path unit like you did with timers and services. So let's just go ahead and copy this one. Instead of path changed, we're using path exists here. What we're going to do is um, when we create uh, slash temp slash ping, we will touch slash temp slash pong. So let's go ahead and run this. Um, and we can check that both ping and pong do not exist right now. So if we go ahead and touch ping, we will see that the unit ran and it created pong. Okay, so I have something like insane with the path exists behavior. So you would think that when you use path exists, it only runs <laughs> the service once, like once it creates the file. Um, but if you read the documentation for path exists really closely, what it does is while the file exists, systemd will keep trying to activate the unit. So if we look at uh, the service here, the service that it created as part of the run, we can we can see that um, it actually hit the start limit because while that file was existing, systemd kept trying to start the unit. At some point, it hits the start timeout limit and then it, you know, it, it dies. Um, it stops trying. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's something uh, you should notice, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, it, it is very, it's very, it's very useful. You have that gotcha. The other one is that this is using the What's the name of the thing where it's I notify? Yes. So uh, as you know, I notify. It's a best case effort. So you may lose some um, some events of it. So like I would not extremely rely on it, but it is very useful for things like uh, let your users add a file into the directory, and then you can grab that file and then shove it into another configuration or something like that. Um, we did this for SSH once in uh, the company uh, where. Uh, Chef would write things into into the directory, and this will basically create an SSH config and reload SSH uh, when it starts. You can see that that is very dangerous and cloning, so don't do it. But yeah, that's what we did. All right, so that's the end of the uh, other unit types that we're going to go over today. Are there any questions about that? Nope. All right. Or should we keep going? Okay. All right. So the next uh, module we're going to go over is dependencies. And for some reason, Alfred was really excited about this. <laughs> um, so dependencies are, I mean, conceptually, they seem kind of like easy to understand, but um, in practice, they can get pretty complicated. So the um, if you remember sysv init scripts, um, you run the you know, scripts sequentially based on how you number them. Um, and there's not really a way to say that, hey, this script depends on this other script, except to order them in a certain way based on the file name. Um, with this systemd aims to solve that by creating a way to define your dependencies. Um, and when systemd will try to like graph all the dependencies together, it tries to parallelize the execution based on how the dependencies are uh, kind of linked together. And that's how you can speed up um, startup and shutdown. So instead of running everything sequentially, it aims to parallelize as much as possible. So uh, what does this look like in practice? So let's start with ordering. Um, Systemd provides two ways for you to order your units with before and after. So for example, we're going to be talking about the dinosaur and human service. Um, in the dinosaur service, we are actually going to write before human.service. 
so that when these two units run together, um, we actually have dinosaur.service uh, running before human.service. So uh, we actually provided these units for you already, so I don't have to struggle to uh, copy and paste the contents into the terminal anymore. <laughs> um, so we'll be able to just run this and see what happens. Um, the thing, the other notable thing here is that on both of these units, we use remain after exit. I don't think we talked about that yet. What this does is it keeps the state around um, after the service finishes running so that you can examine it um, once systemd has in memory. Um, this is pretty useful um, if the service successfully exits and uh, you want to see what happened. So let's go ahead and copy the start command. And to show that um, dinosaur ran before human, we're going to check the timestamps for both of these units. So we can do um, systemctl show uh, dash p. We use the active enter timestamp monotonic property. And we will cop first look at the dinosaur.service timestamp. And then we will look at the one for human service. And you will see, if you look really closely at the numbers, that the dinosaur service uh, had activated before the human service. So yeah, super simple so far, right? Before and after. OK, now we get into kind of the bread and butter of like the actual, actual dependencies. Um, so 90% of the time, I'd say, most people will only want to use requires and wants on their units. Um, Systemd actually provides many more ways to define dependencies, um, but those really get into like the nitty gritty of how you want to start, stop, and reload um, certain units. But most of the time you just want to say this unit wants this other unit to start or this unit requires this unit to start. So we're going to test this out with two services, um, life.service and water.service. On life.service, I write that it requires water.service, and we also want it to start after water.service. And water.service, we're going to run bin false. So what this does is it causes water.service to fail when it runs. And you'll see why I do this once I start life.service. Okay. Um, so because I used requires, we would kind of expect that life.service will fail because water.service is going to fail, right? So let's start. Um, this is another gotcha here because when you check the status of life.service and also the status of water.service, you'll see that life.service actually ran successfully, but water.service failed like I said it would. Um, why is that? Well, it's because uh, requires only refers to the act of starting the unit. Um, be the default type for every service unit is simple, which means that as soon as systemd forks, the unit is considered started, um, which I think can be confusing because people have very specific ideas about when their process is actually started, right? You would think that when we exec and we reach the certain point in our process, this is when we want to start. So to do that, we can actually um, use type equals notify. So if we system CTL edit, water.service, and we change it to type equals notify, um, because in our command we don't tell systemd 
sorry, taking a step back. What Type Eagles Notify does is it expects your service um, somewhere in your code to tell SystemD when the unit is started and ready to take, uh, you know, actually active. Um, you do that by sending a command, uh, sending a dbus message ready equals one to SystemD. Um, but because we're not doing that here, uh, we will actually fail to start the unit. We have a tutorial on that tomorrow. Jim, let's play. Okay. So now if we actually try to start life.service, it fails because the water um, service failed and it had a requires dependency. And you can see that system E helpfully tells you that dependency failed for life.service. So in the real world, this is useful like when you want to start your web server uh, after you start your databases. Like this is how you, ga you can do that. In general, this is how system D start in general. Uh, system D says like start everything on the service that it's designed to start and then it uses dependencies to map things out. Okay. okay, now we have a quick exercise for you to do. Um, so keeping type equals notify on water.service I want you to modify uh, water.service to send a ready equals one message. And I give you a hint here, you can try using systemd notify to do that. Uh, just take like two minutes to do that and let me know what you come up with. Okay, so who has managed to send the ready message and like gotten the dependencies all fixed up? Does anyone want more time to try and do that or do you want me to do it? All right, ambivalence. I will go ahead and show you uh, how I would do it. So, um, I'm gonna override the previous exec start by uh, just changing, by adding a blank exec start here. Mm -hmm. And then I will use systemd notify. If you looked at the man page, you'll see that you can send a dash dash ready. Um, and that's all you really need to do. So if we start life.service again, you'll see that it started successfully even with the type equals notify and also water. If you look down, we deactivate it successfully. Um, and to do that in your code, you would use like the SD notify API and things. Oh, there's a question. Yes. <coughs> the question was, can you show the solution? And the answer was yes. Yeah, here's the solution once again. <laughs> And again, uh, we have a whole section of Notify in general. Uh, there's a lot of cool things that you can do with it, so uh, stick around for tomorrow. Okay. <coughs> so we talked about requires. Um, now we're gonna talk about wants. 
So wants is basically the weaker version of requires because what wants says is that we'll make a best effort attempt to start the service, but if we don't do it, like no big deal, we'll just keep moving along with the original service. So we provided two service units here for you, uh, dog.service and bone.service. Let's see. Um, bone.service has the same thing we had in the previous section where we use type equals notify and we run bin false so that it purposely fails um, to start the unit. Um, and in this case, when we actually start dog.service, it will run successfully because we don't have a hard requirement on bone.service. So let's just go ahead and do that. And if you check the status of dog.service, you'll see that it ran successfully and bone.service had actually failed. So yeah, any questions about the ordering and basic dependencies? Yes, question. Oh, I guess the question was if you de de define the unit such that you create like a cycle um, or a deadlock, is there a way to detect that with systemd? Yeah, yeah. So like two units like depend on each other and if one, like, yeah. Um, yes, you, so, y y yeah, I mean, you can create cycles on purpose um, and systemd is able to detect and warn you about it. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to the verify section of the workshop today, but you can use system analyze verify to detect cycles in your units. Um, and you'll see that the crazy thing is when system D detects cycles on boot or like at a target, it will actually delete the start of certain units in order to get past the cycle. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Oh, does the unit know if it was started by a wants or requires? The answer is yes. Uh, there's a lot of conditions in which uh, you can you can basically say, um, because like one of the things is that you can start a unit just because it's it started by requires or wanted, but if you stop the main unit, you will not stop the previous one, right? So, But you can also set systemd to say like, if a user doesn't start this, like, stop it when you don't need it. You can also say no one can start this unit except another unit by wants or require. So you can also like process. So the answer to the question is yes. And you can take advantage of the situation. Okay. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about the install section of the unit. So you saw in the previous examples um, that we added install so that we can actually enable a unit and most of the time we do that because we want a unit to start at boot. Um, so typically we add this statement here, install wanted by multi-user.target. For most systems, uh, multi-user.target is the default target um, that uh, kind of signifies like the end of the user space. Like we, we booted into the system and this is it. Um, there are actually multiple other targets you can do. Um, but let's start by modifying, let's see. Uh, yeah, there are actually multiple other stages of targets um, that you can do and Let's actually do a quick experiment here where we add the multi-user.target to the dinosaur and human services that we did before. We're gonna go ahead and copy dinosaur service into um, slash etc system D system and name it a.service instead. 
And then for human service, we're gonna call it B service. Okay, so here's the disclaimer. This is the part that we haven't tried with Linode. So you, if you're using Linode and now you're gonna reboot your service, your machine. Um, let's hope it works and we don't end this tutorial sooner or later. All right, everyone, we're gonna, you'll see that I didn't actually t modify and add the install at this point. Um, and the point of rebooting here is that we're gonna show that both of those units did not start at boot. And while that is fast in my Vagrant machine, I don't know how long it'll take your Linode machine to come back up. I did try a restart and it takes like a minute or two, so. Yeah. Oh. I think we'll probably just skip straight to the end. We might skip this part. True. Just skip to the end of this. Let's go to the hidden setup for now, so we can do the new service and then we can do Did anyone do a reboot on their Linode instance and come back successfully? Yeah? No. Okay. All right. So if we do system CTL on A and BDAS service, you'll see that uh, they did not start as expected because there's no install on those statements. So we can go ahead and add the install now by copy. Saving, and we also do the same for A. So what I did just now is add the install uh, wanted by multi-user target part that uh, I had above in the GitHub to both of those units. And net, oh, don't forget to system CTL enable, which creates the sim links on multi-user.target, because if you don't do that, it is not gonna start at boot. And if we actually reboot this time, you will see that both of the services are gonna start at boot. Any questions about that or anyone need help? The question was what are the constraints between uh, uh, Oh, what are the differences between adding the install statement and running systemctl enable? Um, so you can only enable units that have the install section. Um, you'll see that if you try to enable a unit that doesn't, um, it'll like give you kind of a long log line or warning about it. Um, basically what the enable does is set up the sim links so that when systemd runs the target, it knows that these are all the different dependencies or services and stuff that it has to run. So getting to the next part of this, we're gonna start talking about synchronization. Um, so I mentioned target units a few times and um, you might be wondering like, what the heck are targets? So targets is another unit type that doesn't allow you to specify anything about it except for like the, the default unit um, properties. And they exist to synchronize all the different services and stuff at different stages of boot. Um, you can think about them as like um, the sysv and it run levels. If you actually look at the man page for boot up, so just go to like man boot up um, and scroll down a bit, you'll see that there's a really interesting chart about how all the different targets get executed as part of a host startup or run. Um, and you'll see that at the very end of it, the user space boot targets can be either one of rescue target, multi-user target, 
graphical target or emergency target. Um, graphical is like when you have um, GNOME, KDE, or some kind of graphical desktop environment. If you're on a server, you don't really have that, so multi-user target is where you end up. And you can actually um, add your own target if you want. So to see what the default target is, you just go run systemctl get defaults. Um, and you'll see that the default target is multi-user target. Um, the way the default target is defined is with symlinks as with um, a lot of the other kind of dependency things. So if you look at the symlink for default.target, you'll see that it points to the um, multi-user target unit file. Um, so the next part of the workshop, um, I just show how we're gonna create a custom boot target, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip that part now and just move directly into the, um, showing you some examples of like how you can analyze boot with um, system analyze critical chain um, and things like that. So if you run system analyze critical chain, uh, what it does is gives you kind of a rough, very rough timestamp of when each target ran when you booted your host um, and the order that they actually ran. So in this case, we still had multi-user target um, and these were all the things that had run before it along with the timestamp. Um, and if you like pictures and pretty things, you, ca you can actually use um, Sysity Analyze dot, pass it a unit name, and it'll generate this crazy graph of all the dependencies on your unit. And I'm gonna try that now. Let's create a new terminal. Um, and let's too big. All right, system analyze dot. Um, I don't know what's our favorite favorite service. <laughs> So you'll see that um, this spits out the dot format for uh, the dependencies of systemd umd, um, but this is not really useful by itself. We are visual creatures, so they say that we can actually use this to turn it into an SVG. Just gotta run that again. And if we have an image viewer, we can actually look at this crazy graph. <laughs> Here's the Linux desktop, everybody. Beautiful uh, workshop. Get up mm -hmm. and get it again. Okay. Yeah. But fine art for you. So there are actually not that many <laughs> dependencies um, associated with systemd umd. <laughs> Um, you can imagine that if you do a more complicated service, this kind of chart gets crazy and hard to look at. Um, but just even like this, it's a lot of the default dependencies and not even the ones we specified specifically. Um, and then the other tool is like systemd analyze plot, uh, which I am not gonna do, but you can run it on your own time. It will generate an SVG of the entire boot sequence and it's like a multi-page visual of like how the time that all the units started. Any other questions? Okay, we are gonna take uh, five minutes breaks, um, bathroom breaks, um, relax breaks. Uh, we are present time, we are gonna finish here at one because of respect of people who work here and stuff. Um, so. 
keep it five minutes and then uh, we'll get back.
Okay, folks, uh, don't forget, we still have some Portos pastries that you can go and take. Come and take, sorry. Um, what is your problem? No, it's just because of the laptop. I have to make a few like files and stuff like that. No, no, it's yes. Okay, uh, I assume we are on the right time, so uh, we are gonna finish this uh, strong. Uh, we have about 30 minutes to finish. Uh, we're gonna do now uh, the beautiful world of journal CTL, right? So uh, as a little bit of introduction, besides of all the controversial part of systemd, systemd also decided to replace like syslog. Um, and other the journal CTL, um, the values that it offers to, to people who manage system is, is really incredible, right? So you can still like not like it, that's up to you, but it is it is really good to to operate on it. So we're gonna do a tutorial on it uh, where we're gonna give you very basic uh, dive into journal CTL. Um, 
we have been using it a little bit, and then in tomorrow's, which is the advanced, we're not going to teach you advanced part of journal CTL, but it commands are going to just show up on the tutorial. So uh, it is nice. Uh, so with not further ado, Anita will start this, and then I will finish it. All right. So like Alvaro said, SystemD comes with a daemon for doing logging, and it's called SystemD Journal D. Um, the way you configure the SystemD Journal D daemon is with the journald.conf. Um, it's stored under the usual places, slash sc slash systemd. Um, and you can look at some of the commonly used properties along with their defaults in the uh, example that we have in the GitHub here. Uh, we're not going to go into configuring any of them today, but um, I'll point out some of the popular ones, such as storage, which you can set to volatile, which will only store logs in memory, persistent, which will store logs on disk, auto, which will try and see which directory exists in order to decide if it wants to be volatile or persistent, um, and then none, where like we don't store any logs at all, we just forward them to wherever you tell them to forward to. Um, there's also a global rate limit that you can set um, with the rate limit properties. You can also set per service log rate limits so that if a certain service is too noisy, you can tell it to shut up faster. Um, and then you can also set the properties on like uh, how many, how much, how big your journal should be on the host. Um, Skipping these. There's also the forwarding behavior, like I mentioned. Um, you can forward to syslog, kmessage, console, or to wall, and they're all pretty self-explanatory. And you can also set the max log level of the messages that go to the journal um, using the traditional syslog levels or with the integers. So on a per unit level, you pretty much only have like six-ish properties to configure how your unit uh, gets their logs into journal. Um, by default, all of standard out um, goes to the journal. Um, you may not necessarily see all the output from standard out in the journal because of how the log levels are set, um, but you know that's how it is. And standard error um, by default just inherits based on the behavior of standard out. Um, and like I said, they, you can also set individual log levels in the service unit and also individual per unit rate limits for your logs. So enough about that. Let's, uh, let's look at some logs. So if you just run journal CTL in your workshop setup, you'll get basically all the logs from the dawn of time, apparently, uh, or when you last booted. Um, and yeah, just, just a way for you to page through the logs and things like that. Pretty straightforward. Um, I usually like to do journal CTLR. What it does is it reverses the log so that it shows the most recent logs on top because I don't really care about the logs from like two days ago necessarily. I want the logs from right now. Um, so that's what R does. And you can also use dash dash since, um, give it some relative timestamps in order to be more um, you know, specific about what which logs are, you want to look at. So if we do dash dash since, these are logs since one hour ago. In 101, we actually did the last 30 logs, um, so I'm not going to run that again here. And you can also use journal CTL to look at journal files that are that you kind of imported or moved over from a different host. So we provided a journal file for you to look at, um, just as an example. I'm going to make sure it still exists. You can pass dash dash file, and you can use journal CTL to look at basically arbitrary journal files. 
This is pretty useful if you need to debug something. Um, a user can just send you your journal file to look at. Okay, okay, cool. So uh, now uh, we can see a little bit how can you, as a developer, uh, write to the journal, right? So we already saw that uh, your unit by default send their std in, sorry, so their std out and std error to the journal. Uh, we provide a small unit over here. Um, and you can go and instead of start first, let's see what it has. Right, so as you can see, it's just saying standard journal, hello, and now we can start. Uh, and that will, if I do status, you will probably see that, yes, it is right there, perfect. And now if I were to do Your journal CTL uh, that you you will see that it kind of shows everything that goes into that unit. Uh, you can also see that it shows other stuff that are like from different PYDs, um, but these are all in the context of the unit. Give me a second. A thing that we didn't say, uh, but we kind of explicitly have been saying, is that when you decided to add a unit in your commands, like the here, you can do the unit with service or without the word service. So without the word serv without the dot service, uh, it just appended at the end, right? So um, it figured it it's figured out, right? All right. The other thing that we didn't tell is that we have set up a tab completion. So if I do journal and then press tab, it autofill it. So uh, you don't actually need to type the entire thing. This is this comes part of systemd. When you install system the add-ons extension, what's the name of the package that you install to get tab completion? Bash mm. uh, <laughs> complete. Ah, I think I think it's come with system D, and if you install bash completion, it comes. Yes, it just comes with system D. Okay, um, that's moving on. I go. So that is one of the ways that you can print to the journal, right? So uh, I also provide, a, oh sorry, we also provide uh, here a nice script that you can look at it. And this is how you can write to the journal with, um, so if you look at that file over there, you can see that is in, that is a importing piston the journal. Um, we're going to talk more about PistonD next in the ne in, like tomorrow, but that's a Python interface to interact with systemd. Um, and basically, we're going to say journal and send the variable, and we're going to send this message. Uh, we're going to set the priority, the message, and the syslog identifier for that one. So if I go here and just execute this script, like remember, I'm not even like. Technically, you're always in a unit. Uh, by you can do that by looking at just like doing system this status on the double pound, and that's your own PYD. You see that I'm literally on a unit. It's just a scope. But yeah, so if I go and execute this nice command, um, and then do grep for hello, you're gonna see that. Uh, I had a I had a message there from super unique ID and then the ID that's the syslog identifier and then hello from pistmd journal printing, right? So uh, if you kind of see that's the identifier that I have. So that's that's how you can like write to the journal from anywhere that you want. Um, uh, I already we already saw that we can. Do this by um, by a unit. Uh, what we didn't saw is that you can ask for the output to be verbose. So um, this is also another th interesting thing that um, the journal has that you don't see it uh, everywhere else. Um, you like if 
let me not take. So you see that like this output is like text-like and the thing that you're used to. There is a bunch of metadata under under the hood, right? So when I do verbose, you can actually see a bunch of more variables being set. So you can actually, like since you can read this, you can do stuff based on whatever the, the message was or the or the login. You see like there's a syslog identifier there, but it also kind of tells you like what was the command the host name, uh, the message it says, it kind of gives you like the PYD and the command line that was executed, and you have the sysgroup and the unit from which this came, right? So there is a lot of information. So you can look, we already saw that you can look for unit, but you can also probably search by sysgroup or or any of these or any of or any of these um, um, filters. Okay, cool. So yes. Um, mm -hmm, that's interesting. Oh yeah, we can also do this. Journal CTL PID1, and this shows you, we are searching, like we saw for filters, so we're using everything that comes from PID1. Uh, as we know, that's the init system, system D. Um, you can also do this. So look at all the messages that come from a unit, but from the PYD, right? So if I delete the PYD, Sorry, uh, this is going to be more easy. If I, if you see, like there is a message that comes from the thing that was exec, but systemd itself add logs to that, saying like the things that it was doing. So if I just want to see that, because sometimes it is useful, you can do pyd1. Uh, this doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. All right. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, we have some exercises here that. You probably can go and, and look at them. Uh, the first one is uh, view the metadata from that file again, and you can see what, what files there was. Um, uh, we're going to leave like one minute or two for people to, to do this, and then we're going to do it ourselves. the file. Was it already? Oh shit. No, I didn't copy the thing. <laughs> I copied the I copied the I copied the entire fix of the world. Okay, so and this Okay, so as probably you already figured this out. Uh, you just need to mix everything, and then you can just do that, and then it will show you everything that was running. Uh, it's ask you, okay, so let's take this one. We can basically take that one and then say unit. And perfect. The PID was three three three. Since you make this uh, this this part, uh, am I right? Uh, yes, I got Anita's approval. Okay, right. cool. So, um, any questions so far? No. Okay, great. So, um, let's do the last things, right? Um, Journal CTL, if you do this mech, uh, you get the message from the debug kernel. Um, you basically get everything that you used to get with that one. Uh, journal CTL list boots shows you the boots of the, the machine. Uh, and finally, if you, this one is not a good example because it only has one boot, but if uh, if you do with that it just show you the logs for the current boot. And that's the that's the journal introduction. Go ahead. You can you can mix and match. Like for instance, uh, uh, one thing that you can do is that. Uh, like this one, you see, has like file solution, but I can you can also add another unit, right? Uh, I don't know if systemd 
on D. Yeah, so like, and it's fine. It's going to show you the journal. Probably UMD wasn't running on this one. Uh, bad example. Let's do it here, though. Uh, so there is journal. Um, uh, wait. Yes, press U. You said? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, believe me, it's somewhere there. Um, all right. That's the. Yeah, that's the one. Um, okay. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. So uh, the question was, uh, sometimes you do system decat and it logs as echo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so there is a batch of no, so no, no. So there is a bunch of um, of things in play there when you're logging to syslog. Uh, the first thing is that I system decat cut and some things try to log as the main feed of the process because like it's assuming that system D cut is not the one that is doing the log so it it provides your information to say like oh system D cut is the one by the way uh, this is what we're talking um, so yeah uh, so system D is it's so it's go this is gonna go and show and try to to uh, put stuff into the um, into the into the journal right um, but it makes no interest uh, to see like oh is system D cut the one that is showing so system D try to cut tries to operate as the parent pid if you are running as a user like niche mm -hmm. by the way niche uh, the um, like you. Whatever you start doesn't have permission to execute as another thing. But if you're running as root, you can. So systemd cat will ignore itself and then will appear as the other. This is very common when you do systemd notify, which is the thing that we're going to look tomorrow. But yeah, so uh, there's a lot in place. The other thing that has to be in place is that by the time journal D sees the message, the PYD that sends the message has to exist. So there is a race condition there where you cannot have attribution on the logs. It is, it's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so what Nish was saying is that he basically tried to do a denial of service on his journal CTL, uh, and some of those messages got mis misattributed. Yes, this is something that happened. And I think we are done for the day. Um, so who here has learned something new today? That is great. We are very grateful. Uh, we really appreciate that you guys came here. Uh, thank you very much. And have a great rest of your day for the conference. And see you all tomorrow morning at the same time, same place. Okay, so we have 15 minutes, and we have one more example. Do you guys want to see it, or it's the time to go home? Okay, let's try. Okay, let's. Okay, so, disclaimer: we did this for Fedora 37, but uh, let's see if it works. Okay, so uh, the example is the following: um, go into. So this is the one that we're going to do. It's the workshop, workshop, analyze, system, the analyze, and Um So we're going to do a thing that is called uh, system, the analyze security. If you type this into your into your terminal, uh, what this is doing, it's giving you an opinionated, an opinionated by system D of a uh, how secure your services are, right? So the definition that system D has for secure uh, has a lot to do on, let me take a step back. So in the old days, um, you start your service, like you start an application, and this application or this service that is running, start with the same privilege as you, and inherits everything that you 
could do, right? Uh, it has the same view of the file system, so if you can write into root, the service can write into root, and, and all of those things, right? Um, today, this is not necessary, right? So if, if you're having, if you have an application that all it needs to do is check uh, if you have unfinished downloads, there's no reason why it have to be able to write into Barlib, right? So you can actually m hide a lot of the system, right? Maybe your, maybe your application doesn't need to even see home directories because like, why would you get access to your SSH keys to a random service? So you can actually hide them. So all of the things that systemd provide for you, if you don't enable them, they call your system unsecure, right? Like it's again, it's opinionated. Let's pass that, let get past that. Uh, but you see they have some services here and we have a lot of them uh, and they have some data in them. Um, all right, so. We're gonna try to do one with Nginx, right? So let's do systems, system de-analyze security Nginx. And it's gonna show you all the things that it thinks are broken for Nginx, right? So it shows you all the properties that you can set that would change uh, system D, uh, the, the Nginx behavior. And it has something that, oh, this is great. It has private TMP. Right, so that means that TMP itself, it's mounted as a RAMFS, uh, so Nginx doesn't have access to your host system. D, TMP just has a, like a shim version of it. Uh, so if one application store stuff there, Nginx cannot see it. That's kind of like the whole idea, right? right. So before we start, let's try to start system CTL Nginx. And you're gonna see that it fails, right? And it kind of tells you Hey, execute this command to see why it failed. And it says, uh, uh, it says very not useful information. It says that it failed to start uh, because it fails to open bar log nginx error log, right? So uh, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna copy the, in the, the, the nginx config, the previous nginx config, and then we are going to edit that config to do in line seven, shut, uh, line seven, we're gonna change that error log. Wow, <laughs> sorry. Line seven, we're gonna change this to be that. Uh, basically, we're saying instead of like storing logs into a directory, because we actually want to like avoid uh, Nginx to write into stuff, we're gonna say just send it to syslog server, which is just journal D. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the access log that is on line 22. Uh, yeah, looks good. Uh, we are also, why, why this keep happening to me? We are also going to edit this Nginx unit and we're gonna change the log directory to this is another unit, this is another setting that is just gonna set a unit, uh, a directory for the logs. Okay, and now we can start Nginx. Finally to start, and then we can do a curl to port 8080, and if it returns okay, it's, it's like we, we got Nginx to work. That was not part of the tutorial, that was just like cloudiness that it comes with the thing. All right, cool. So now let's try to improve a little bit on of Nginx. So uh, we're gonna edit the Nginx, and now we are gonna add these following uh, settings. These settings are actually kind of cool. What they make, uh, and this should be on for most things, um, First of all, it makes private devices. That means that everything that is in your bar log 
that has to do with physical hardware, sorry, bad luck, uh, uh, dev, or dev, uh, that has to do with physical hardware, um, it, it's not allowed for the unit to see it. Like for instance, like uh, there's no reason why Nginx has to write directly into your CD room, right? Or your hard drive. So we're just gonna say you're not even gonna see an SD1 or an SD2, you don't need that. Private TMP, I already announced this, it basically uh, for TMP, it mounts a tempfs that nothing has access to it and only Nginx has access to it, so there is no co cross-contamination. Uh, Protect Home makes a home, I think, read-only. I don't remember what true does, but there's options where you can like make it hide home. The other one is just make it read-only so that nobody can write it. Uh, and this one are other options that uh, has to do with kernel. Like, you're not, Nginx is not gonna load a kernel model, so like, why even like, I'll give it the chance that it could do it? So all of this, right? So we save it. We restart it. We check that we can still query. Uh, and yeah, we can, we can still query, so that exists. So let's see if we can analyze Nginx again. And we go to the end, and we now see that uh, the overall exposure went up, right? Uh, not, not exposure, but the number went up. Uh, now we can do a couple of the fun ones, right? Um, so we can see if there is a socket. So there is no Nginx socket file. Uh, and I re just realized that we haven't actually looked at what socket files are. Um, but we can go and create a socket file. Um, now we have to say force. Yes, so with these options, we will create a socket file, and then we can add this content. What this is going to do, it is very simple. So Nginx start as root, because it needs to open port 80. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is that, sorry, Nginx start as root, open port 80, and then downgrade itself to whatever user you tell it to run. Um, but we don't need to do that. What we can do is just let systemd start listening to port 80, and then when Nginx starts, systemd will just handle that file descriptor to, to Nginx. So that way, Nginx never even have to be root. Right? So this is what we're doing right now. We're, the, we're creating an nginx.socket. Uh, we're setting listen string to port 80. We are exiting BIM. And then we are going to edit the nginx. And we are going to add the following options. For the unit, we're going to do what Anita just told us to do, which is set up after and requires. And then we are going to add the following things to the service. Uh, we're going to say the type is simple. Uh, we're going to say that please don't rely on PYD files. Uh, we're going to set an environmental variable. This is the one that tells Nginx to read uh, the sockets from file descriptor three and four. And we're going to say private network so that Nginx uh, like cannot access other things other than this port, right? So Nginx itself cannot open ports. So if, so if somebody hacks Nginx and can execute stuff, they cannot uh, start listening to, to other that is not 80. Uh, so that looks great. We, can st we are gonna stop Nginx socket and service, just in case. And, we're, and then, remember when Anita was showing you that you can start the timer and then the timer will start the unit or the path. This is the same, right? So we're going to start the socket, not the service. You can start the service, but we're going to start the socket. Now, if I do status on the socket, it says, "Oh, great! It is it is running, right? It's listening, all the information, nice." What if I what if I say the service? The service right now you say that it's loaded, but it's not running. It's going to run the first time that somebody hits port 80. 
it's the same as the timer, right? So when, when timer gets to a time, it executes the service. The socket, when somebody hits the socket, is going to start the service. So if I were had eyesight, I could have done it. Then I could paste this, and then yes. And then as you can see, it took a little bit more the first time. And this is, of course, because it started the service. You don't have to do it like this, but it's kind of useful because at, uh, right away, uh, because up until you actually require the service, you're not wasting resources on it. Question. Yes, so the question was, can system D, or is there a way of, of preload uh, the service uh, before somebody asks? And the answer is yes, you just start the service and the socket at the same time. So where is the stop? Yeah, so you can actually start. Oh, actually, yes, so you can start it, and then uh, the status of the service is up. So now my whatever I do by curl should also be instantaneous, right? But it's still going through the socket, right? And if I understood Anita's tutorial correctly, I should be able to just start the service. And this, uh, yeah, and by just the sheer magic of dependencies, start the service system is so that you actually want the socket before starting the service. The beauty of the socket, it is like if you're not latency bound, uh, you are saving a lot of resources by not having something running. Okay, so this was it. Okay, and and I and I want you to see that we are doing all of this because we want to. Uh, there you go. We want to minimize that number here. We want this is the one that we want to improve, right? Uh, we're already improving it a little bit. So let's do. Let's add more stuff. So now that we actually don't need to be root, we can just, uh, now that we don't need to be root, we can just uh, set these variables here. And what they all do is very simple. We're saying, yeah, just start as Nginx and group Nginx. Don't even think about being root. Uh, like. Um, we, the only capability that you have is that you can bind to the network. Uh, and this here over here says, like, systemd will create some directories for you that you can use that you don't need to create, like bar run nginx. Like, nginx doesn't need to create this directory. It's already there by, by systemd. Uh, the same with the state, bar lib, uh, bar cache, and etc, right, for the configuration. So now nginx doesn't need to be able either to read or write this, sorry, to write these directories. So to create, uh, okay, we save it. Uh, now we can go and uh, remove the user nginx from the um, here. There is a line that says that the user is nginx. We can go and remove that line. Yes. And that's great. And we can also remove the line uh, PYV, this one over there. Uh, we can go and delete the logs directories. We no longer need it. We can stop. We can start the socket. And then we can do analyze. And now we have a happy face because system they really logs emojis. Right, so um, the security just went up to 4.8. Yes, that's still the case. And now if you really, really, really want to overkill it, we have like more options that you can go down. Uh, again, we're two minutes. And I think that takes us to 4.0, right? So this is 4.8. If we do this, it will take us for 4.0, but how much secure you wanted to have it, that's up to you. But the point is that uh, you get all this feedback loop of you add stuff, what it's doing. Keep in mind that this is one definition of security. It doesn't really have to be uh, the one, but as long as you can still curl your s service, and it, okay, that wasn't working. Let's assume it was. Uh, all right, uh, but as soon as you can get your service to run, that's what you want. And on time.
So thank you. All right.